go ahead and get started. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for tonight's seminar on men's health, a focus on erectile dysfunction and Peyronie's disease with our VCU health doctors, Sarah Krostick and L'Oreal Smith-Harrison. My name is Sharni Smith and I am a member of the VCU Health's marketing team. I will introduce our speakers before the presentation starts, but I'd like to first mention that during the presentation, if you have any questions, please make sure to add those to the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom, uh, the Zoom form, and that way we will be able to moderate your questions at the end of the presentation. So first I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Crossman. She recently joined VCU Health's expanding team that treats men's sexual and reproductive health with a goal of building this program into a center of excellence. During a fellowship at the University of Virginia, she gained specialty training in leading edge treatments of male infertility, erectile dysfunction, Peyronie's disease, adult acquired buried penis, scrotal lymphedema, and narrowing of the urethra. Her research at VCU continues to explore new treatments in these areas. Thank you, Dr. Krostick, for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Next, I'll be introducing Dr. L'Oreal Smith-Harrison. <coughs> he is an assistant professor in the Division of Surgical Urology in the Department of Surgery at VCU Health. Dr. Smith-Harrison treats conditions such as low sperm count and or sperm that moves improperly, vasectomy reversals, sperm retrieval, erectile dysfunction, and infertility problems caused by hormone imbalances and spinal or nervous system injuries. He works alongside a team of urologists and clinical staff focused solely on men's health and improving each man's quality of life. The urology specialty has progressed significantly over the years with improvements in genetics, microsurgery, allowing the team to offer more interventions tailored specifically to the patient. Dr. Smith-Harrison's research interests involve variations in access and utilization of men's health resources and infertility. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith-Harrison, for joining us tonight. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so once again, please remember during the presentation to add any questions that you have in the Q&A section, and we'll be sure to answer your question later. I will turn the presentation over to you. All right. Thanks, um, thanks everybody, for um, joining us. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Can you guys see my screen okay, the PowerPoint? Okay, great. Yep. Okay, so um, as was mentioned, I'm Dr. Krostek and I have Dr. Smith Harrison here with me. We are um, <clears throat> members of the urology division at VCU. Uh, and we focus on men's health disorders, uh, medical and surgical issues. Um, so tonight we just wanted to uh, give a brief presentation about two very large topics. So this will kind of be a truncated presentation, um, hopefully touching on all of the common things that you might encounter or have questions on specifically when it comes to erectile dysfunction and Peyronie's disease. Um, so I think it's important to start off with just a little bit of anatomy and these pictures are a little bit complicated, but um, just to try to break it down in terms of the anatomy of the penis and how that relates to erectile function and Peyronie's disease. So a couple basic things. Uh, important to know that er um, erections are generated by nerves that originate in the lower spine and the pelvis. Um, and these nerves stimulate blood vessel dilation in the shaft of the penis, which is filled with um, the spongy tissue that fills with blood uh, during an erection to become rigid during an, an erection. And during an erection, the rigidity is contained by this layer that surrounds the penis called the tunica albuginea. Um, one of the most common causes of erectile dysfunction is what we call venous leak, where the blood in the shaft of the penis is not sufficiently trapped by this tight outer layer. 
um, which results in blood leaving the penis too quickly and loss of an erection. In terms of Pyronis disease, um, it's thought that micro traumas over time, small traumas lead to buildup of scar tissue within these outer layers of the penis, which results in an area that's not as stretchy as the rest of the penis, can't expand with an erection like normal penile tissue and leads to a curvature in that area. So just to kind of give you a basic um, outline of the anatomy of the penis, I think that helps to understand um, some of the concepts that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna start with erectile dysfunction. And just as part of a background, um, again, erectile dysfunction is defined as a chronic inability to sustain or achieve a penile erection. And it's very common um, increasing with age and can be seen in about 50% of men who are over age 70. There are lots and lots of risk factors for erectile dysfunction, um, age being a big one, medical conditions like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, um, depression, high blood pressure, um, smoking is a big one. Um, patients who have had private pelvic or abdominal surgeries can sometimes uh, sustain erectile dysfunction as a result of that, spinal cord injuries, and certainly uh, there are many medications that can contribute. Going along with this, because of these risk factors, erectile dysfunction is thought to be an indication of underlying heart disease. So when you see a doctor for erectile dysfunction, even if you have no other medical conditions, your doctor may send you to see a cardiologist or a heart doctor just for an evaluation to make sure there's not some other medical condition which can be contributing to that. Um, and I, I mentioned depression or other psychological uh, conditions or factors. Um, it's actually recommended in our guidelines that we send patients to talk to mental health professionals um, as part of their treatment for erectile dysfunction if the patient's interested in that because that can sometimes help improve outcomes in terms of the treatments that we can offer. Um, so when you first present to your doctor, there are some things that they may do to work up your symptoms. Um, sometimes they'll give you a questionnaire to help us evaluate the severity of your symptoms and to track response to any therapy that we prescribe. Um, they'll do a physical exam, um, and then they'll check some blood work usually. Usually we check a testosterone, uh, blood sugar levels, other lab values that may give us an idea as to if there's any, um, if you have any other cardiovascular risk factors. And then sometimes we'll also do an ultrasound of the penis or induce an erection with a medication in clinic to really assess things in certain situations. Um, so we'll move into some of the treatment options this is probably the most interesting part uh, for people to tune into. Um, and briefly, uh, there's lots of things out there. Most of the stuff we have still is aimed at treating the symptoms of erectile dysfunction. We still don't have much that will treat the underlying cause, um, but we'll talk a little bit about that here. Um, so again, we'll go through some things like lifestyle med modifications, um, medications, and then getting more into prosthetic devices and surgical implants. So lifestyle modifications is a big one. Um, we often counsel our patients um, to consider things that they can do to optimize their erectile function um, from the get-go. And like I mentioned, it can be an indication of underlying heart disease. So things that you can do to improve your lifestyle treat both things. They can improve your heart health and your other medical conditions. And also that goes hand in hand with erectile function. These modifications are most effective if they're started before age 50, but they do still have some benefits um, at, at any age. So we recommend them to all of our patients. Um, and you know, we, knew, we do know that things like obesity and unhealthy diets um, can lead to inflammation and free radicals, which damage the blood vessels needed for erections. It can cause low testosterone, which can cause um, decreased sex drive and erectile dysfunction. Uh, we know that um, regular exercise can improve erectile function, and that's regardless of whether the um, exercise also improves blood pressure or blood sugar, which we know it can do. So there's something about exercise that also improves erectile function outside of other heart health factors. Like I mentioned, smoking is a big one. Um, that damages the blood vessels in the penile tissues, which can lead to erectile dysfunction. Uh, the more you smoke, the 
more erectile dysfunction is caused by that, so it's um, linked that way. Long-term use of large quantities of alcohol can cause liver damage and low testosterone. And then, like I mentioned, medications is a big one. Um, there are over 200 medications that have been linked to erectile dysfunction. Um, and most commonly, these things include blood pressure medications, um, like hydrochlorothiazide is a big one, and then all the antidepressants, um, SSRIs, um, those medications are notorious for causing erectile dysfunction. So um, a lot of times we'll see patients referred, uh, and that's something that can be changed um, with a conversation um, with your, the prescribing physician or your primary care doctor if, if they think it's something that can be adjusted to help with that. Just um, a quick, just a quick comment, yeah. uh, Dr. Krasik. So typically, what I tell patients, medications aside, is that anything that's heart healthy is healthy for your penis. Mm -hmm. So all those things that she talked about: exercise, good diet, keeping your blood pressure under control, not smoking. It's <clears throat> not only you're protecting your heart, but you're also protecting your quality of life. Um, so it's really, really important to to kind of focus on that and make that part of your daily your daily life. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, moving on to things that you can take um, to supplement things. So there are a lot of herbal supplements on the market out there. The research on those has shown that they're no more effective than sugar pills. And a lot of times because they're unregulated, they have other medications in them like low-dose Viagra and that sort of thing, which um, can be dangerous for some people. So in general, we don't suggest that you take any herbal supplements to try to boost erectile function, just because it doesn't have um, much uh, evidence-based um, support for that. The medications that we don't do work, um, I'm sure everyone's heard of these, the things like um, Viagra and Cialis, those are the trade names for these medications. Um, this table down here is um, kind of detailed, it's just, included here to show that they're all very similar, um, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis. Um, they have different lengths of action and wash out of your system at different times. So Cialis um, lasts in your system the longest. Um, all of these medicines, you have to take about 30 to 60 minutes before sexual activity, and they do require some stimulation to work. They won't just cause an erection if you take the pill. And most of them, except for the Cialis, you have to take on an empty stomach because the absorption into the bloodstream depends on um, whether or not you have food in the stomach. So uh, for the Viagra and the Levitra, empty stomach, less important for Cialis. The way these medications work um, is by uh, blocking a pathway in the um, smooth muscle tissue of the penis. So that is affecting um, blood vessel dilation and allowing for the inflow of the blood for the erection. In order for these medications to work, you have to have an intact nerve pathway. Um, so patients who have um, severe diabetes, who have nerve damage from their diabetes or who have had pelvic surgery or prostate surgery, these medicines tend to be less effective for those patients just because of how they work in the body. Um, other important things to remember is that we, we can't prescribe them to patients who take nitrates for chest pain. And if you also are on a medicine to help your urine flow for your prostate, try not to take them at the same time because it can um, decrease your blood pressure a little bit. Usually pretty well tolerated. Some men will experience some headache or flushing, nasal congestion on them, um, but overall pretty well tolerated. Other medications that we have, we have uh, intraurethral suppositories. This um, Muse is the trade name for that. It is called Al uh, Alprostadil is the generic brand. This works at a different location in that pathway um, to at, delivers the medication kind of directly into the penile tissues. So this form of the medicine works a little bit better for guys with the diabetes or the pelvic surgeries because it's kind of bypassing this um, intact nerve pathway. 
Um, the way this medication works, as you can see here from the diagram, is that you put a tiny suppository tablet into the urethra, and again, it dissolves and delivers the medicine directly to the penis that way. Still relatively well tolerated, a few side effects that include penile pain or urethral burning. Um, the downside to this one is that you can't use it if you have any sort of scarring in the urethra or if your partner is pregnant, unless you're using a condom as a barrier. Um, and I find in practice that it's not quite as effective as the injectable forms of the medication, but uh, it is an option that we discuss with patients. Along those lines, um, <clears throat> the next line of therapy is an injectable medicine. It's the same type of medicine in that suppository tablet, but it's an injectable form that you di inject directly into the side of the penis, again, bypassing the body's natural pathway. So it's very effective. Um, it works within about 10 minutes, um, and it comes in multiple different forms. You may have heard of Trimix or Caverject, Edex. These are all just different variations. This Trimix has this same medicine combined with other medicines that target different areas, all to result in an erection. Um, the side effects with this one, penile pain with injection, as you can imagine, but the needle is very small. It's like an insulin needle, and most guys tolerate it pretty well without too much discomfort. Um, it can result in erection lasting longer than four hours. If that's the case, uh, you need to go to the emergency room, and we can administer a different medicine to counteract those effects, um, but uh, that's pretty rare with this. Um, and because it, re it requires self-injections, guys, if it works well, guys like it, um, but sometimes sticking with it for more than a year or two becomes challenging just because of the repeat injections, but certainly a very effective option that we treat a lot of patients with. Um, there are also prosthetic devices. So um, there's an external vacuum pump that exists. Um, this is the brand that we prescribe most commonly. It's developed by the Augusta Medical Systems. Um, we recommend this one because it's a medical grade device that helps prevent overpressurization of the penis. Um, but you can usually find these uh, online or at um, novelty shops. You just have to be careful that they uh, won't overpressurize and cause damage to the penis. If you're on blood thinners, this isn't a great option because it can cause bruising. Um, and then it, it just requires some some attention to detail to get it to be most effective. You need to trim the pubic hair. Um, there's a lubricating gel that you put around the base to create a good seal. Um, you inflate it, it pulls blood into the penis, and then you slip a silicone band down around the base of the penis to hold the blood into the penis to cause the erection. Should know that the band may squeeze enough that uh, the ejaculate won't come out of the tip of the penis when you have an orgasm. That's common with this. Um, and some men may notice the penis has kind of a coolness or a change in the skin color because it's pulling venous blood into the penis instead of arterial blood, um, which doesn't cause a problem, but some men notice a difference in the quality of the erection with that. Um, and then on to surgical treatments. So um, we have uh, implants that we can place for patients who aren't responding to any of these other forms. And then some patients do choose just to go straight towards these because they're very effective. They come in three different types. Um, there is a semi-rigid bendable rod. Um, this works pretty well for men who don't have very good um, hand function, uh, less prone to malfunction because it doesn't have so many working parts. Um, the only downside is that it's a little, it's less natural looking because it stays rigid all the time, but uh, it's pretty simple to use. You bend it up when you want to have an erection and you bend it down when you're done with the erection. Um, and then there's inflatable ones. There's a two-piece and a three-piece inflatable. Basically, the concept is that there are these um, uh, balloon cylinders that we place inside of the penis shaft, and then a pump in the scrotum, and then a reservoir of fluid. So um, when you want to have an erection, you pump the pump in the scrotum that sits next to the testicles. It pulls fluid from the reservoir into the shaft of the cylinders to make those rigid enough for penetration. And then when you're done with the erection, there's either a button to deflate it or you bend it to deflate it to drain the fluid out of these cylinders and the erection goes away. Um, since that's a surgical procedure, there are some risks associated with it. 
Uh, very rare risk of an infection. If that happens, usually the device has to be removed because antibiotics um, don't work really well when the infection is on the device. Um, there's also a risk of injuring your water channel or the urethra during that surgery. Um, and because it's a man-made device, it does have a shelf life. We usually say um, that uh, at about 10 years, 80% of them still work, but 20% may require replacement due to malfunction of the actual device. Um, but these uh, devices are very, very effective as long as patients have a good understanding of kind of what it's going to look like cosmetically to have one. It's all internal, but uh, the erection you get with this, while rigid enough for intercourse, doesn't look like the erection that you had when you were 20. Um, but the function is excellent. Um, sensation usually unchanged, so orgasm sensation is all still normal. Um, so a great option for some guys. Um, the surgery is relatively straightforward. It takes us a couple hours to do, and then most patients are able to go home either the same day or just after a brief overnight stay. So j just one Please. small thing, yep. uh, Dr. Yep, Krostic. So in terms of just expectation from surgery, um, in terms of length, what I typically tell guys is ex basically expect what, what you have in terms of length when you just pull your flaccid penis straight out, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, because the cylinders don't go into the glands or the head of the penis, you're not getting, that's not going to be engorged like it would be if you're 20. So basically whatever you can get with the stretched penis is what to expect. So it's not going to be <clears throat> the glory days of when you're 20, um, but it's very functional and satisfaction rates are 90, 95% plus. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you. These novel therapies, I know patients are starting to see more and more of, and a lot of people have questions about these when they come to see me in clinic. Um, so I did want to spend just a little bit of time talking about these. Um, specifically, I hear a lot of questions about the shockwave therapy and the stem cell therapy. Important to remember that all of these things are still considered experimental. And I know that there is a men's health clinic in the Richmond area that is offering these types of treatments to patients. Um, at a very high out-of-pocket cash cost in an unregulated fashion. So I try to steer patients away from that, um, that men's health clinic. You might see advertisements for it on TV, um, but really we don't know enough to know how well it works, how long it works, what dose you need, um, you know, how it's working. So um, while it is promising in the early studies, still too early to really say, and I recommend that you, you know, don't waste your money unless you have a lot of extra money to just be thrown around, which um, I don't, so <laughs> I assume most people don't either. Um, so the, um, the shockwave therapy, this is one that we're really focusing on a lot, and um, I spend a lot of my time at the VA, and we're working on uh, getting this approved in a study at the VA. There are studies on this technology um, all over the place. We're working on uh, getting a study going at VCU. They have one at UVA. They're doing this all over the country, um, and people are pretty excited about it because in the early studies, it seems like it's able to stimulate um, regrowth of the blood vessels and nerves that help cause erection. So this is now getting into the treatment of the underlying cause of erectile dysfunction rather than treating the symptoms, which are all the treatment options we've talked about before. Um, it's very well tolerated, has very few side effects, no injections, no needles. This is um, just a model of what one of the devices looks like. Um, again, we're still trying to determine exactly how it's working, how many treatments you need for how long, how long do the treatments you know, work after you stop treatments. Um, so still a lot of unknowns, but very promising early stuff. The other thing you hear a lot about is stem cell therapy, which is an injection. Um, we Basically, your own stem cells are harvested and, and um, grown in a culture and then re-injected. Um, we think that this may lead to regrowth of nerves. Um, and actually, patients, when they've had both the stem cells and the shockwaves, that may improve the outcomes of both but still very early in its uh, investigation, and, and we don't have a lot of um, good research on this therapy quite yet. 
And then the other one that we might hear more and more about is called platelet-rich plasma, also an injection where you take um, this, you take a blood sample from you and then they spin it down and isolate just this one portion and re-inject that into the tissues. Similar type thing, we, may, we think it may lead to growth of new vessels and has been effective in animal models. So, um, so up and coming treatment options here, but still all considered experimental just for something to keep in the back of your mind. Dr. Smith Harrison, do you have anything to add about those? Nope, all good. Okay. So that's kind of it for erectile dysfunction. I wanted to spend the last bit of time just talking about Pironi's disease, which is another very common condition that we see in um, men presenting in our clinic. Um, still pretty common. Um, reported rates up to 13% of men have this. We think it's more because of um, men maybe just not be coming forward with the condition. Um, and most commonly it presents in guys age 50 to 59. Like I mentioned, we think this is a result of deposits of scar tissue in the outer layers of penis, which cause kind of a fulcrum around um, which the penis bends during an uh, erection. It can cause um, curve of the penis. It can cause trouble with erections. It can cause penile pain, um, difficulty with intercourse. And all of it is very dependent on the patient and the partner. So some guys with really bad curvatures aren't bothered and we don't need to treat them. We just let them be. Um, some guys with small curvatures are very bothered and we do go forward with treatment for those patients. The cause is not 100% known. Uh, like I mentioned, we think it is resulting from uh, repetitive penile traumas, like little traumas that accumulate over time. Um, but some guys are more prone to getting this than others. It does seem to be linked to smoking and alcohol use, um, prior prostate surgery, whether that's for benign enlargement of the prostate or cancerous. It has been associated with low testosterone, um, so that, that has been linked there. Sexually transmitted diseases have been linked, um, but we still don't know 100% what causes this. Um, they rarely go away on its own, um, so if you have this condition, it's worth going ahead and seeking some evaluation for it. Um, and it has two phases of the disease process. So there's an active phase where the scar and the plaque is undergoing changes. This can take over to a year um, for this to occur. Some improve, um, some stay the same, and some get worse over that course of the year. So that's why we watch closely for a year um, to see how the disease is gonna settle out. And then once you're in the stable phase where you don't have any more changes or worsening the curve, then we can start talking about the surgical treatments for this without worrying that it's just gonna get worse after we do some sort of intervention. When you go see your doctor for this condition, um, some of the components of the initial evaluation, again, include a physical exam where we can examine the plaque itself and the penile tissues. We often will induce an erection in clinic using one of those medications, the injectable medications that I talked about in the previous slide, so that we can um, assess erectile function. Uh, we can assess how severe the curvature is and measure the angle. And then sometimes we'll also get an ultrasound of the plaque and of the penis to look for calcifications in the scar tissue um, or any other thing that might affect a, a, a surgical plan. The treatments for Pyronies, um, there are lots of things out there. there some, some of these are kind of historical uh, when we don't often recommend these anymore. So basically, um, oral medications or pills are just not effective in treatment of the actual disease. So um, here I mentioned so PDE5 inhibitors. Those are the pills for erectile dysfunction that I mentioned, like Viagra and Cialis. Those don't treat the plaque, but they can help treat the erectile dysfunction, which can be associated with um, Pyronis disease. Uh, but these other medications that you can take, antioxidants, vitamin E, um, don't really have much effect. Topical medications that come in creams that you can apply on the penis. Um, this medicine, Verapamil, um, has is, is an injectable medicine that we'll talk about in a minute, but they've come up with a topical form. Doesn't seem to be effective either because it doesn't quite get into that scar tissue when you apply it to the skin. 
Um, the shockwave therapy that we just mentioned for erectile function is being used for some of these, um, for Pyrone's disease as well, but it hasn't really shown to improve the curve. It does seem to improve the pain associated with the curve, um, but not the curve itself. So getting into what treatments actually work, the important thing. Um, so there have been um, developed in the past these traction devices that you can put over the penis. The older versions of this were not very user friendly. They required very long periods of time, um, you know, up to six to eight hours a day, which just is not practical. Uh, but there's a newer device out there called the Restorex, which um, is only two 30-minute sessions per day. Um, and it has been shown in the initial data to restore some length to the penis, which can be lost with the Pyronis disease, and some improvement in the curvature as well. And we think that this works by basically um, bending and stretching that plaque to kind of loosen that up so it's not so tight, it doesn't cause such a severe curve. But um, this is available for purchase. Not many insurance companies are covering this yet, but um, I think it's very promising, and I talk about this with all my patients as well. Um, and then the most commonly used things to treat this condition um, are injectable medications and surgery, which we'll talk about here. Um, so injectable medications, the goal of these is to soften the plaque and remodel the plaque. Um, there are lots of different things that have been tried. Uh, people have tried injecting steroids into the plaque. This doesn't work very well and has a lot of um, side effects, local side effects at the site of injection, so we've stopped injecting steroids. Um, verapamil and interferon are two medications that we do still inject. Um, we think that they work by potentially blocking some of the pathways, the cells that are responsible for depositing the scar tissue in there. Um, but most likely what they're doing is because it requires um, multiple um, passes of the needle into that scar tissue is that it actually is breaking up the plaque just by putting the needle into the scar tissue. Um, it requires multiple injections, which can be uncomfortable, um, but does seem to have some effect. Collagenase or Zyaflex is the one that I think most people are gonna be familiar with. They have a lot of commercials that you can see on TV. Um, this medicine actually dissolves and breaks up that plaque when you inject it directly into the plaque. Um, for guys who have a more than 30 degree curvature, that's when we start to consider this medication. Um, it improves the curvature by about 35%. So guys with really severe curvatures, you know, if you have a 90 degree curvature and you're only going to get a 30% improvement, that still probably isn't going to get you straight enough to have sex. Um, so that's something we keep in mind, kind of depending on the severity and also what the patient is interested in um, having treatment. The risk with this um, pain at the injection site, you can get a bruising there. Very rare risk of what we call penile fracture, um, which is where that tough outer layer can um, break um, during an erection. Um, but that's very rare with this type of medicine. But regardless, we counsel patients that they can't have sex um, during the treatment because of that risk. Um, and it, it is pretty labor intensive. So you have to come to the doctor's office twice a week for four weeks um, with modeling at home and that's the treatment cycle. In terms of surgery, um, we have a couple of surgical options to treat this as well. Um, the most straightforward is called penile plication, which is basically where we put stitches, permanent stitches on the side of the penis opposite to where the curve is to basically pull it straight. The risks with this is that um, guys sometimes can feel a little knot of a suture under the skin that stays there after the surgery. And it can result in some shortening of the penis because the curve shortens the penis. So when you're just pulling it straight, you know, the length of the short side or the curved side is the length that the ultimately straight penis will be. So um, that's something we counsel patients on. Um, we can also try to incise or remove that plaque, that scar tissue, and graft in a healthy, stretchier material. Um, 
This option uh, can result in erectile dysfunction, so it's best for guys who have strong erections before surgery. Um, it's also good for guys who have kind of a more complex penile deformity because of the scar tissue or large calcified or hard plaque um, or severe curvature. Um, again, we talked about the uh, risk of erectile dysfunction with this procedure, which is worse with more severe curves or um, older patients. Um, very rarely guys can have some change in penile sensation because the nerves um, for penile sensation are often and very closely located around that area of the plaque. So um, that's a risk that we tell people about. <clears throat> and then if patients have both erectile dysfunction and a severe curve, um, we can do you know, one or more of these things, but we can also implant that same penile prosthesis that we talked about previously because that will um, allow us to straighten the penis just with the implant. So sometimes just putting in the implants, um, if the erectile dysfunction is severe, will treat the curve. Sometimes we have to kind of do what we call modeling, which is where we try to bend and break that plaque once we've put the prosthesis in to get it straight. Sometimes we still have to remove the plaque and put in graft material. Um, but in general, we're able to get um, things pretty straight with that. So that is uh, everything that we were going to talk about this evening. Um, just a summary. Um, so erectile dysfunction and pyrenees disease are very common and treatable, though we don't yet have a cure for either. Um, they can be associated with low testosterone or other underlying medical conditions. So uh, it's important to go see your doctor for these conditions because it can, you know, even though some people may say, well, it's just a quality of life thing, but it can um, be an indication of something more serious. So worthwhile being evaluated for. Um, lots of treatment options are out there. Uh, it's just a matter of weighing the risks and benefits and figuring out uh, what the patient wants to do and uh, get the partner involved and um, we work together to kind of figure out what's going to be the best option for you. Um, and like Dr. Smith Harrison said, the best strategy for maintaining good quality of life is just be proactive with your health now with preventative health care, exercise, healthy diet to try to stave off as much of this as we can. Um, I listed here some additional uh, resources for you guys. If, um, these are reputable websites that you can go to and get some good um, trustworthy information about these conditions. If you wanted to do some additional research, um, I recommend these uh, websites here. And uh, we're happy to take any questions. Thanks, sir. Dr. Krostic. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Krostic, for that. It was such a very informative presentation. Um, so I will go through and ask the questions. Um, we have a question. With all the various treatment options available, how do I figure out what the best option is for me? That's a really good question. Um, so it, it sort of just depends on the conversation um, that you have with your doctor. And, you know, when we sit down together, we go through all those treatment options in detail, the risks, the benefits. And then sometimes there's some, you know, the doctor will go over your other conditions and what your goals are. We may think that one option is most likely to, you know, benefit you versus another. Um, my general treatment strategy, you know, I offer all these things up front to guys, but I find that most guys prefer to start with the pills if they're able to, and then we kind of progress from the pills to the injections to the surgical implant. Um, but all of those are first line treatment options, kind of depending on patient preference. The pills too, um, you know, some for some guys, one pill works better than another. So even if a guy has failed one pill, like the Viagra didn't work, some guys will have a better response from Cialis or something. So um, there's a lot of, you know, trial and error and just working together as a team to kind of figure out what your goals are and, uh, you know, to come up with a good strategy. And we, we work with you until we find something that works. Yep. Well said. So, I mean, my, my approach is basically to maximize quality of life while being as minimally invasive as possible. Um, and so basically a lot of it rests on you, the patient, how far do you want to go? Um, 
So if the pills work, fantastic. If you're not happy with that, you ramp it up a little bit. Um, but kind of the core of it is just a conversation and looking at the details of kind of your specific situation. So it's never a one size fits all or even one size fits most. Mm -hmm. It's really a patient to patient uh, decision process. Perfect. Um, the next question we have, for the inflatable penile prosthesis implant, what is the normal recovery time? So um, I usually tell guys, like I said, go home from surgery the same day to the day after. You're going to be pretty sore for a couple weeks. Um, I have guys start to kind of feel in the scrotum, feel where that pump is starting on day one to try to kind of gently pull it down to the bottom of the scrotum to make sure that heals in a place that's going to be easy for you to reach after the surgery. Um, then I have patients come back at about three weeks after surgery to start learning how to inflate and deflate it. That's kind of when the pain from the surgery has subsided enough that it's not going to be too painful, but hasn't been so long that it's going to get really healed in, and which makes it harder to inflate and deflate. So um, we have guys start practicing with like inflating and deflating it a couple times a day at about three weeks. And then after about six weeks, you're healed enough to be able to start using it for sex. So you can't use it for sex for six weeks. Um, but, you know, most guys are starting to feel kind of back to normal after three, four weeks or so. But um, definitely sore for a couple weeks. Plan to take a couple weeks off of work, I would say. Okay. And the last question that we have is how does scar tissue or plaque build up in the urethra? Um, that is a slightly different um, disease process. Um, what we think happens there is that um, guys who sometimes just get it spontaneously, some guys develop some scar tissue if they've had to have a catheter placed for another surgery or something, um, or if they've had any sort of instrumentation like prostate surgery that, or a stone surgery that we've had to use instruments to go into the urethra. So some guys don't ever get scar tissue from those types of things, and some guys do, uh, and some, some guys get it really severely. So um, again, we don't have a really good way of predicting how that happens and who that's going to happen to. Um, but those are kind of the more common causes that we generally see. Um, and then the treatment for the scar tissue in the urethra or the water channel is different. Um, sometimes we can just dilate that open or make an incision uh, all on the inside of the urethra to open that up. Some guys need a more formal operation where we have to physically remove that part of the scarred urethra and hook the urethra back together to get that channel to open up. So um, slightly different process, but uh, certainly something we see pretty commonly. Um, and we actually just have one more question come in. Mm -hmm. um, since there is not a cure, are there clinical trials to look for a cure or what research is being done to find a cure? Yeah, so for erectile dysfunction specifically, um, the, the clinical trials for the shockwave therapy and for um, some institutions are doing clinical trials for platelet-rich plasma. We don't have anything like that in Virginia as far as I'm aware, uh, but we certainly are starting um, trials for the shockwave therapy, and we think that those are most likely to be able to cure the process of erectile dysfunction, but we, we don't know for sure. Um, so there is research going into that. Um, in terms of Pyrone's disease, um, the, you know, the cure per se is just kind of removing the plaque surgically and putting in the graft material. Um, but we know that guys are, you know, some guys are just susceptible to having that scar tissue and can form it again. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't know if there, I'm not aware of any research um, in terms of like therapies to help prevent formation of that type of scar tissue or anything like that. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Smith Harrison has heard of anything like that. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with everything you said. Um, certainly in terms of Peronis, um, just a small little caveat in terms of cure for erectile dysfunction. Um, I think it helps to think of this not as a penis issue, 
it's more of a, a usually at the heart it's more of a blood vessel issue mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about heart disease if you have if you have known heart disease we're not talking about a cure it's more optimizing the heart's function the blood blood vessels function knowing that uh, we're never going to get back to where you were in your 20s again um, so it's more of an optimization and that's the goal of the shockwave therapy is to optimize um, function with hopefully some new uh, creation of blood vessels and if you look at kind of the early studies so just like your heart interventions work best kind of early on in, in, in the process um, so if you have really poor erectile function that shockwave therapy is still probably not going to help because we're just too far gone. Mm -hmm. um, so the cure, just like work at keeping your heart healthy, is baseline staying healthy and then trying to uh, address anything at the early stage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like Dr. Smith Harrison is saying, the more severe the disease, the harder it is to treat. So getting it early is best. Um, some of the shockwave stuff has suggested that we can, in some cases, maybe um, guys who didn't respond to Viagra, who then get the shockwave therapy, then do respond to Viagra. So um, in that case, you know, if the erectile dysfunction is severe, we may be able to get you improved enough that the pills start to work again or something like that. And then this is also a question I get sometimes is, well, if it's a blood vessel issue, why don't you do surgery on the blood vessels to fix erectile function? Um, basically, it's the number of blood vessels and the size of them that are involved. Um, it's just not surgically possible. Um, there are really rare instances, usually after traumas or things like that, where there's a single blood vessel issue that sometimes can be fixed, but that's exceedingly rare. Um, so that's one reason why surgery for the blood vessel issue use, uh, isn't really an option. Awesome. Well, thank you. Dr. Krosig and Dr. Smith Harrison, it was such a pleasure having you speak on this topic tonight. Um, and for all of our Participants, please feel free to visit bcuhealth.org in the urology section to learn more and also to visit our physician pages and profiles to learn more specifically about them. Uh, thank you all for joining and have a great night. Thank you guys for tuning in. Have a great night. Thanks. Have a good one.